insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. I'm pushing the wrong buttons here, too. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. Just like, what are you doing? This, this is... Redo. Screwed up episodes 116. <laughs> Slave one is no more. So much for dry rehearsals, you know? Yeah, right? I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my charming, eloquent, and fortunately tolerant co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, sweetheart? Oh... Uh... Is the week over yet? See, what happened was <laughs> we didn't have any bloopers on Insights into Teens, so I had to come up with right, something for the right, blooper Right, right, there you go. <laughs> is that what it was? That's what it is. Okay, sure. Hot enough for you? Uh, not right now. I'm actually kind of yeah, cold. <laughs> it, actually got, it actually got much better, but it was about 95 it hit yesterday. Something like that with a heat index of 105. 105. Yeah, it was pretty so, brutal. Yeah, pretty that brutal. whole heat dome... You know, we weren't as bad as, you know, some of the other places that were in the hundreds. Yeah. Um, you know, but well, still. I saw, uh, was it Portland or Seattle? Got yeah. Got up to like 115. Yeah. Like insane. So, so Israel has the Iron Dome. We have the Heat Dome. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. That's not what we're talking about today. No. no. Oh, okay. No. We just flickered. Did you flicker? I, I saw it. That's not good. Uh oh. Yeah. Are we still live? Is, uh, it, is this thing on? Yep, yeah, we are. We're still live. Okay, it flickered. It just flickered there. So. Well, we're going through some thunderstorms right now. So yeah. So who know. knows? We might. Don't know what's going <laughs> we on. We might there. have to like go through this really quick. <laughs> we, we might be back in a few minutes. <laughs> you never know. So, in our Disney detective today, you can now explore hidden rooms from the Pirates of the Caribbean in a popular new game update. Plus Scarlett Johansson and Disney team up on Tower of Terror. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, Disney asks for a rename of Slave One. And Star Wars The Clone Wars lands three daytime Emmy nominations. Good for them. Mm -hmm. Then in our entertainment news, who claims not to be the one who makes Britney's life miserable? And the Black Panther sequel has officially begun filming. And then, of course, we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. And we have a growing list of afterthoughts to yeah. touch on briefly at the end of the show. So stick around for that. Mm -hmm. Before we get into that and everything else we have to talk about, we've got a busy show today. I would invite our listeners and our viewers to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment. You can get a video versions of all the network's podcasts. Listed as insights into things, pretty much anywhere you can get a podcast, Google, Apple, Spotify, and so forth. I would also invite everyone to uh, email us, contact us, give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insights into things dot com. We are on Twitter at insights underscore things. On Facebook, you can catch us at facebook dot com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we're at Instagram.com slash Insights Into Things. And links to all these and much more is available on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Shall we start? Sure. All right. Go for Disney Detective. So our first story comes from InsideTheMagic.net, and it talks about the Pirates of the Caribbean ride and some changes uh, that they've updated to it. So, of course, the worst part about visiting Walt Disney World or Disneyland or any Disney park is that at some point you have to leave. 
So dealing with the Disney blues is something almost all Disney fans have to face, but there's a way to kick that sadness out and turn it into a magical reminder of happiness. So from adding Disney decor to your home, mm, yeah, check, done that, uh, to watching Disney, Disney attraction videos on YouTube. Check, done that. Uh, there are many other options for fans to be reminded of the magic. So now there is a new video game that may not only help with the Disney blues, but also allow fans to dive deeper into the attraction that Walt Disney himself created. So the Sea of Themes... Uh, blah, 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 blah. Sea of Thieves, A Pirate's Life, just released a collaboration with Disney, and the video game follows Jack Sparrow's adventure that we have seen in the Pirates of the Caribbean attraction. Although the video game takes inspiration from the films, it sees, uh, seems that some of the aesthetics and settings are very much based on the Disneyland version of the attraction. So players not only feel like they are in the ride while playing, but they're able to explore rooms and scenes that typically a guest would not be able to get to from their boat. So on the Disney Parks blog, they had noted um, that if you think riding the Ca Pirates of the Caribbean attraction immerses you into Jack Sparrow's world, uh, this game brings you to a whole new level. Uh, it shows, showcases several iconic scenes from the original 1967 Pirates of the Caribbean attraction, like the treasure room, the ship battle, and the jail scene featuring the dog holding the keys. Uh, pirate fans can adventure and explore through these well-known scenes brought to life in the game in a be in beautiful detail and truly an authentic um, that's authentic to the classic attraction. Um, and obviously, you are the player and the main character in this. Um, so many Disney fans who you know love all the details about this. Um, have actually, you know, posted about it as well. So there was actually a TikTok that was done where they showed a side-by-side -side comparison of the ride to the game. And it was, you know, pretty spot on uh, with it. Um, the person that wrote this article also talked about, you know, as someone who had played VMK, which was something that I used to play, you used to play a little bit as well, um, that in its heyday, you know, Disney fans were really immersed in that because it was a whole theme park, but with all these little mini games as well. And now it kind of gives you that chance to to relive, you know, at least that part of the attraction. Um, so Sea of Thieves, A Pirate's Life is available on mobile, Windows PC, uh, Steam, and Xbox. Yeah, so Sea of Thieves was an existing game that was a pirate game that was out there. Right, so now this is the Disney is a, version. Is, right. So, is so it's it, a different version. So it's a different version. Mm -hmm. The game is not an add-on for the mm -mm. game. No. Oh, see, that wasn't what I, okay, I thought it was just an add-on for the no, existing game. No, it's a different Because the game itself is great. It was a very realistic game. Like mm -hmm. When you were on your ship, like, to sail your ship, right. you had to, you know, put the sails up and angle the right, sails and, right. and steer it. And, you know, mm -hmm. it was a very hands-on yeah. multiplayer experience that Sam and I would play. Mm -hmm. uh, and we would play it over the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of the, the graphics were always kind of cartoony with it. Right, right. And, uh, and know, that's what this kind of looked like, too, because I watched the trailer right. for it. And... So that's yeah, kind of cool, kind of cool, and mm -hmm. you know, I I think we both kind of miss VMK very much. So the uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean was my favorite part of right. it, right? Which was going just, it was so cool sailing around and yeah, you know, and trying to blow up the other ships. Yeah, and, you yeah, know. yeah, it was it was really fun. So it it was kind of sad to see it go. But Haunted Mansion was my favorite, but you know that's not really surprising. Well, and Disney <laughs> has Disney has this this habit of coming out with this popular mm -hmm. you know interactive game experience and then pulling the plug on it they right. did the same thing with the infinities right you know we went out and we bought all the infinities figures in fact i have all the star wars ones sitting downstairs on top of the tv right and you got so invested in it and then all of a sudden they pulled the plug for no good reason it wasn't a lack of sales or anything right right yeah um, so yeah, mm. hopefully they're not going to do the same thing with this. Yeah. Well, you have to buy the game. So, you know. Well, yeah, you had to buy the other stuff too. Right. But the game's not, once you physically have the game, 
you can still play it. Well, it's an there's an is there there's an online element to it though, right? Uh, maybe because there's the Sea of Thieves itself is an online interactive oh, element. Okay, to it. you so can maybe play it offline too. Right, right, right. I so gotcha. I, I gotcha. don't want to see him pull the plug on like the interactive I see side what you of mean. things. So, I'm so not, you know, hip with all that stuff. You're, you're not the gamer side of the in- entertainment. All the games podcast. that I play are on my phone. And that's why you don't get motion sick. <laughs> that's exactly why <laughs> I do it. The smaller the screen, the better you are. <laughs> I can't handle those. Big. So so tell us about Scarlett Johansson's next So project. now it seems that Scarlett Johansson and Disney are teaming up to redo or come out with a new version of of a Tower of Terror ride, or uh, not ride, movie, based on the ride. So Scarlett Johansson, uh, obviously, she is well known in the Disney Marvel universe uh, as Black Widow, who actually has a movie coming out within the next two weeks, I believe. Um, It seems that she is attached to produce the Tower of Terror, the Holly... um, Uh, The Tower of Terror movie, which the report came from The Hollywood Reporter. So it seems Toy Story 4 director uh, Josh Cooley is penning the script for the project, which is based on the classic Disney theme park ride. So plot details are being kept under wraps, and it's unclear if the Oscar nominee would even act in the project. So Johansson is producing uh, with her these pictures banner with Jonathan Jonathan Leah um so the tower of terror uh first opened in 1994 at Disney's Hollywood Studios and then other tower of terror rides opened in Disney California Disney's California Adventure and France's uh, Walt Disney Studio Park, and then also at Tokyo Seas. So the ride is known for its ending with a terrifying drop. Now, for some of you that might remember, there was a TV movie that actually came out in 1997 that starred Steve Gutenberg as a reporter investigating the cases of a 1930s uh, hotel where people mysteriously disappeared and Chris. Uh, Kristen Dunst was actually playing his niece in. I remember that. Movie. I remember. I actually enjoyed that one because that was the only way I was gonna ever enjoy the ride because there was no way I was ever gonna go on this. Um, so obviously Disney has found past success with films based on rides such as Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, which has spawned five films. Um, so the Tower of Terror and development probably shouldn't have. Well, some of them were better than others. Uh, Tower of Terror development comes as Disney prepares to unleash another ride feature. So Jungle Cruise, which we've talked about before, that will be opening up the end of this month, starring Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt. And we won't talk about the Haunted Mansion one or the Country Bears one. We'll only talk about (laughs) Pirates because that was the only one that overall... $4.5 Four point five billion dollars combined. So well, I think it's interesting that she's she's going to be producing it, mm-hmm. um, and they haven't announced whether or not she's going to be partaking right. in it. I have a feeling she probably won't star in it. I'm curious why she would be producing it though. Mm. Like, well, what, it's her company, so I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but like, what interest does she have in that particular? You know, mm-hmm. there has to be some tie. Something you're mm-hmm. gonna you're probably gonna see some kind of tie in that is coming. Maybe. Out of it. So. Black Widow went to the park and, you know, got caught on the ride or something. Or maybe this is her way of turning Tower Terror into a Black Widow ride. Mm, like Guardians they did with of the Galaxy. The Guardians of the Ga- okay. So that's, maybe. that's a possibility. You never know. You never know. So that was all we had for our Disney detective. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. <laughs> For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Starforge server for nightly events such as operations, 
Flashpoints, World Boss Hunts, Star Wars Trivia, Guild Lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. for tales from the edge of the galaxy. So our first story comes from JediNews.com and it seems that Slave One is no more. Long live Boba Fett's starship. So with the release of Boba Fett Boba Fett's <laughs> Boba Fett. He's having a fit over it. <laughs> he's, having, he's so mad. Uh, iconic ship in the latest Lego incarnation. You will notice that the name Slave One has been dropped in favor of Boba Fett's starship, as directed uh, by Disney, it seems. So during Lego Fan Media Days last month, the Lego Star Wars team of uh, Jens Harvod... Uh, Fredrickson sure. and Michael Lee Stockwell were asked about the name change as they showed off the set for the first time, and this is what they said. So, hey, there's this is the next one. It's the Mandalorian. It's Boba Fett's starship. Yeah, well, I built another, but we're not calling it Slave One anymore. This is Boba Fett's starship. Well, why'd we drop the name? Mm, well, everybody is. It's probably not something which has been announced publicly, but it's just something that Disney doesn't want us to use anymore. That was basically... That, yeah, yeah, that was the confirmation <laughs> that, we got. That was the confirmation. So, hmm. So it seems that it is a new 478-piece Lego uh, set, which is just called Star Wars Boba Fett Starship. Uh, it'll be available on August 1st. Uh, it'll come with minifigures of Boba Fett and the Mandalorian in it. So it kind of... And there was another article that came out, which we didn't include, but it was talking about all the different Star Wars sets that were coming out, and it basically just said Boba Fett's ship. It wasn't saying uh, anything. So there were a couple of other little things that kind of talked about it like, okay, so can you not call it Slave One anymore? Is that the cancel culture right. thing? Like, Yeah, and I think this is a, this is being a victim of political correctness. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there's an entire story behind it mm -hmm. that explains why it's called Slave One. And okay. the fact that it's been handed down from father to son. Mm -hmm. If uh, anyone played the Bounty Hunter game for the PS2, I think it was, uh, in the game, one of the missions is actually acquiring the new ship itself okay. and how it's named and everything else. So there's there's a lot of story around it. Mm -hmm. And it was never something that was offensive. Right. Nor I don't want to say it wasn't offensive. It wasn't intended to be mm -hmm. offensive because the references that it made were all in universe. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then does Jabba the Hutt not have slaves anymore? Does slavery not exist anymore? Was Anakin not a slave now? So it's like... Slave Leia. Right. You can't go back <laughs> What do you call scrub. her now? <laughs> right. You can't go back right. and scrub Star Wars because a few people might be offended by it. Any more right. than you can go back and scrub history and say that mm -hmm. slavery doesn't, that didn't exist. You right. can't use the word slave anymore. Right. It's like you can't do that because then you 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 water down your history and you lose mm -hmm. the significance of right. it. Right. Right. If anything, you, you take an opportunity like this to maybe educate people on the right and wrong surrounding the term. Or maybe have Boba Fett rename his ship. Or you do that in, in the series. The series that you know that's coming up. He decides, you know what, I'm no longer a slave to whoever. Right. I am now I'm not a slave to the Empire anymore. Right. So it's So I'm gonna It's Liberation One now or something, you know? <laughs> I, I don't know. Baby Yoda one. <laughs> but, you know, my, my point is that right. there's a way to do it right. Mm -hmm. And then there's a way right. to make an obvious choice, but not address the elephant in the room. Right. And that's the course Disney's going here. And that's the wrong way to do it. Mm -hmm. Because there's an educational opportunity here that they could yeah. take advantage of. Anyway, just my two cents. Okay. Not going to rant on that one. Okay. I'll rant on the next one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> wasn't a bad one. <laughs> 
Tell us about the next one. So our next story comes from StarWarsNewsNet.com, and it seems that the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences announced the nominees for the 48th Annual Daytime Emmy Awards Children's and Animation and Lifestyle Categories, who say that five times fast, which will be celebrated in two live streamed events on July 17th and 18th. And it seems that the Clone Wars was nominated for three different categories. Um, So the categories hit on three different targets, outstanding writing team for a daytime animated program, outstanding music direction and composition for a preschool children's or animated program, and outstanding sound mixing and sound editing for a daytime animated program. Whew, that was a whole lot. And now you know why they do this <laughs> offline. Right, exactly. Uh, so obviously I didn't watch this last season of Clone Wars, but you did, and you seem to be a fan of it. You thought it was well done for um, you know, coming back into the, the story. Um, what was nice about uh, this as well was that Star Wars official social media accounts also celebrated the news with tweaked versions of the main uh, season six poster, basically congratulating uh, the different nominations that they um, had received. Yeah. I mean, the series itself was actually very well done. I, I get a kick out of the fact that the, uh, they associate the awards with preschool shows because yeah. Clone Wars is not a, <laughs> a preschool show. Um, the only criticism I think I had about some of it was they had they had they had introduced some fluff episodes in there that mm-hmm. did nothing for the overarching storyline. Okay, um, and they they mercilessly used the plot line on a couple of the episodes to launch Bad Batch, mm. <laughs> like. Like literally, they were, it was completely disjointed from the rest of the seasonal okay. arc, just so they could introduce these guys and give them their own show. Okay, um, but you know, as with anything that Dave Filoni does, it was fantastically written. The animation has gotten progressively better, mm-hmm. uh, and it was a perfect cap for the the other season for the entire series. So right, right, definitely deserving. Uh, I hope they they pick up a couple of these. Mm-hmm. So. That was all we had for our uh, Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. We're going to take our last break, and we'll be back with our entertainment news. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. Sir, our first story actually comes from TMZ. I'm so surprised that at you. <laughs> Sometimes you can go with the rag. It's okay. So this has been all over the place. Um, you know, all of the different news outlets have been talking about poor Britney Spears and and the conservatorship and and everything and and the the legal battle that that's basically going on between uh, her her family, you know, her dad, really, uh, who's the primary of this conservatorship and uh, do they even need it anymore? And, and you know, various different 
uh, celebrities are coming out. Um, it actually, I think, started, what, last month, the month before, where it was the hashtag Free Britney when, I guess, news of the conservatorship was kind of coming to light. And there were all these court cases, um, you know, where she's basically trying to get the court to overturn everything. Um, you know, so now her dad has basically fired back at uh, at. Uh, Britney's allegations uh, that he's taken away her freedom, even the right to marry. And he says that that actually falls on his successor, uh, that he, you know, isn't really in charge anymore. I guess it's kind of more in name only or, hey, not really in name only, but hey, you're giving me all the money, <laughs> uh, really. Um, and it seems that uh her dad had filed legal documents claiming that he has not had any involvement in her personal conserv uh, her, uh, conservatorship, um, meaning making decisions on behalf of her for nearly two years. Uh, he says that he hasn't even spoken to her, uh, that he's been cut off from communicating with her. Um, he then also blames uh, lays blame with the restrictive rules that are in place by the current personal conservator, who is Jamie Montgomery. Uh, he says that Brittany's lawyer also filed documents uh, to appoint Montgomery. Uh, and he claimed that at the time, Brittany did not have the mental capacity to make decisions about her medical treatment, and therefore it was left to the conservator uh, of her person, who is now Jody Montgomery. So basically he's saying yeah, that the, ne the court never found that she was unable to uh, to consent to medical treatment and the court never made such an order. And it's just like this whole back and forth, really. Like I, I kind of feel bad for, you know, everybody involved, you know, she's basically saying that she has, uh, you know, no reproductive rights that, you know, that's basically being handled by this. She can't get married. She can't have kids, you know, and, and it's just, like we were talking, you know, before this, like, yeah, she went through a phase where she was a little out there and this was kind of put into place to to help with things. But, you know, at this point, let her live her life. You know, it's not like she's a little kid. Um, you know, her children are older. Uh, you know, she's been doing well for the most part. Uh, you know, obviously she even posted, you know, on social media that um, I might seem like things are OK, but sometimes things aren't. Everybody has bad days, but I don't want to keep lying and, you know, everybody thinking, oh, everything's all hunky dory when it's not because she just doesn't feel like she has control right. of her own life at, at this point. So, yeah, yeah, it's one of those things where the conservatorship, when it came in at the point in her life that she was at probably saved her life. Um, I agree. Yeah. Probably a few times. I mean, I think she was going down a path where she would have been the next celebrity that OD'd mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever it was. Um, but there comes a point where you have to assume personal responsibility. And I think the courts are kind of overstepping their bounds here right? by allowing this to continue and in the process, you've got her father, for instance, is right. drawing a hundred thousand dollars salary off of his daughter mm -hmm. to handle what he's handling for her. Right. At that point in time, does he really have her best interest or his best interest yeah. at heart? Yeah. You know, the courts need to kind of step in here and be the the mature adult here. Mm -hmm. You know, they need to be the ones that go in and say, "Look, this is her life at this point in time. You've dug her out of this pit." Right. She has to be able to le live her own life. Yeah. Uh, and she needs to be able to surround herself with people that are out for her best interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think clearly right now that's questionable. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's unfortunate. But uh, first world problems, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what else do we have? So our last story came from MSNBC or MSN.com. And it seems that the Black Panther sequel has now officially begun filming. So fans have been waiting for a follow up to Black Panther ever since the firm, uh, the film came out in 2018. Obviously, 
Anticipation turned to heartbreak when, last summer, Chadwick Boseman had passed away after battling uh, cancer. Uh, His loss obviously sent shockwaves to fans, uh, fellow actors, and the entertainment industry as a whole. So on top of that, it was... Um, you know, what were they going to do with the film? There was so much speculation going back and forth. Uh, would they, uh, recast the role? Would they digitally replicate him? Um, you know, where were they going to go with the storyline? So obviously not a whole lot has been, uh, released about it yet. Um, so what we do know is that the role has not been recast there won't be any digital replication. Um, they basically had said that uh, Disney confirmed that they would be honoring his legacy and portrayal of T'Challa um, and that they will explore the world of Wakanda and the rich characters introduced in the first film. So not too much of a teaser yet as to what they're doing, but at least we know he won't be replaced in it. Yeah, and there's a certain amount of comfort I think we can take in in the fact that that role was his role. It's, mm-hmm. it, it, no one's going to come in and take it over. Right. They're not going to cheapen it by mm-hmm. doing CGI. Right. Uh, and I would be willing to bet that they're probably going to have a tribute in the film. I could totally see and that. And they're going to end the character in the film itself mm-hmm. so that they can move the story forward. And it's going to be a tearjerker. Oh, absolutely. You, you know you're going to be bawling your eyes out. Absolutely. And, you know, justifiably so. It was a very mm-hmm. sad chapter in, oh. in yeah. the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm-hmm. So that was all we had for our entertainment news of the week. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick of the week is um, a documentary uh, that is on Netflix called This Is Pop. So you get to uncover the real stories behind your favorite pop songs as this docu-series charts the impact of the festival scene, auto-tune, boy bands, and more. Uh, This was a really interesting variety of a show. It wasn't really, you know, one genre. You know, it was basically all pop and what made pop music. Um, And each episode is done a little differently, so it's not like the same formula, so it's a a little bit different format, it's a different host that they have that narrates it and does it. Um, But again, it's a wide variety, so if it's something where, hey, I'm not really interested in watching the country episode, you can pass on the country episode and you're not going to miss anything. Um, You know, so each episode is kind of a a standalone in it. Uh, So the first one was the boys to men effect. And it talks about how the Philly sound meets classic Motown um, in the crossover um, that became boys to men. And then the string of inspired boy bands that kind of came in after that. And it was interesting because I remember when boys to men came out and all the other bands that came out after, but never realized how it all kind of fit together um, and then how kind of boys to men got lost in the shuffle when all these other groups kind of came to light, never really had the same success, but kind of pushed boys to men, you know, out of the way. And now all of those groups are all having success again as they come together all in like the same concert, they, you know, they're doing the, these concerts all together. Uh, then, you know, one of the other episodes was talking about auto tune and how, you know, auto tune was, uh, trying to enhance the, uh, the music industry and how it kind of actually helped destroy some of the music industry, um, with, you know, some groups that I didn't even, you know, know of because it was more of like the rappers and things like that. But it was interesting, again, to hear these backstories. Um, the one really interesting episode was the Stockholm Syndrome. And it talked about how Sweden had become music's stealth superpower. And basically, you know, not only was it with ABBA, but Ace of Bass and um, mu- music and songwriter Max Martin, who... You might not know the name, but, 
you definitely, you know, anybody that listens to any music from the 80s, 90s, or even now has heard a song that he's, you know, written or produced. Um, you know, and then, of course, they had the, the country episode, which country is not my cup of tea, but it was still an interesting, you know, episode to to watch. Um they also went across the pond and, and did an episode about Britpop and how, um, you know, there was this rivalry with these two bands that, you know, I just kind of knew the songs. I didn't know all this backstory because all of it was was happening over um, in Britain. Then they talk about all the different festivals, you know, so like Woodstock was kind of like the first big one that happened. And then how all these, you know, um, Lollapalooza and all these other uh, festivals kind of changed, you know, the music scene as well. Um, Then they kind of went a little heavy hitting with the what a song can do, talking about the the songs that help with protests and 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 different things like that, and even you know modern day, you know things that just happened in you know the last couple of years and the power of of certain songs. Um, and then the final episode, which was kind of interesting, was the Brill Building, which this famous building in New York that was kind of like the powerhouse of all the songs from, you know, the late 50s, 60s, you know, and 70s, um, where it was just basically almost like um, uh, a, a, a warehouse of writers coming out with all these, you know, pop songs um, and kind of, you know, the, the history behind that and where it came from. So really a very cool, you know, if you're into music at all, and again, any genre, just fascinating and and they have you know interviews with performers and and writers and you know people from behind the scenes that you know never get in front of the camera to hear you know their story of how they came to be so really really interesting cool pick thank you so my pick this week to no one's surprise is a documentary it's actually kind of a drama documentary. It's called Across the Pacific. And no, no, I'm not talking about the 1942 American spy film starring Humphrey Bogart. <clears throat> Although that is actually worth a, a watch. Though. Oh, it's okay. Very we'll add that. So uh, this Across the Pacific is a series about the great aviation milestones uh, in 1935 about crossing the Pacific Ocean by the Pan Am flying boat, the China Clipper. The documentary series recounts the development of this technological innovation led by Pan Am's chief executive, Juan Tripp, pilot Charles Lindbergh, airplane engineer Igor Sikorsky, and radio engineer Hugo Luter... I'm, I'm blanking on the name here. <laughs> Luteritz. Not, not ludicrous. Luteritz. <laughs> that, that was part of the pop that music was, one. Well, yeah, I, that was, that's what I keep seeing whenever I see that name. <laughs> With dramatic reenactments, interviews uh, with historians and biographers, and archival photographs, newsreel clips, and film, it puts together this uh, complete package uh, with with the actor reenactments. And there was one uh, show, one documentary that we, that we used to watch, who, uh, when they would re- do actor reenactments, they would get actors that looked literally the least like the character that they were playing. And they do the same thing in this one. So the character that plays Lindbergh, for instance, looks nothing like Lindbergh. So that is like your biggest <laughs> thing when it comes to these shows is like, get somebody that looks like him at least. Uh, yeah, like, you know, <laughs> with CGI and everything, they can probably do better. Mm-hmm. So this three-episode miniseries tells a remarkably detailed story of one of the more glamorous moments in aviation history. Episode one, titled Airborne, introduces the film's four main characters. You have, as I said, airline executive Juan Tripp, Charles Lindbergh, Igor Sikorsky, and Hugo Ludacris. I'm just going to go with that at this point. <laughs> sure, why not? Uh, as, they str- as they separately struggle to find a place in post-World War I aviation. Their struggles illuminate the challenges all aviation pioneers face in these early days. Uncertainty. After repeated setbacks, the four men join forces and capitalizing on the Air Mail Act and the aviation mania triggered by Lindbergh's 1927 transatlantic flight, 
set out to build an airline to South America. That airline turns out to be Pan Am. Mm. Episode 2, The Latin Laboratory. As they push southward, Trip, Sigorsky, Lindbergh, and Ludacris build larger flying boats, harness radio to navigate safely across greater distances, and with the help from the U.S. government, outwit all competing airlines to dominate service in Latin America and launch the global air tourism industry. But all of this is merely preparation for their ultimate goal, flying the oceans. Tripp spends six years carefully laying plans for Atlantic and Atlantic crossing, only to have his hopes dashed when Britain refuses to let Pan Am's planes land because their own plan, planes can't make the ocean crossing. With $2 million in new planes on order, Trip is stymied with no ocean to cross. And then finally, in episode three, another ocean, with his path across the Atlantic blocked, Juan Trip surprises even his own staff by turning to the Pacific. Now, you have to understand that traveling across the Atlantic and the Pacific are two very different things mm-hmm. because of the distances involved. So, defying the skeptics, Pan Am builds an airway to Asia, allowing its airplanes to hopscotch across the world's widest ocean by landing at five stepping stone islands, Midway, Hawaii, Wake Island, Guam, and the Philippines, all of which become key points of contention during World War II. So Hugo Luteritz's radio direction finders point the way Igor Sikorsky's latest flying boat, the S-42, pioneers the route, before eventually giving way to the Martin M-130, known as the China Clipper. Within two years, Pan Am is offering regular passenger service to Hong Kong, connecting America and the Asian mainland. Air service from New York to London begins in 1939, completing a chain of airways and circling the globe. And what's interesting is looking at where air travel is today and seeing the consolidation that we've recently started going through with our airlines. Mm -hmm. You know, Pan Am doesn't exist anymore. Um, You know, AirTran doesn't exist. And so these, all these, all these uh, airlines that started out can all trace their roots back to this. Um, You watch Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. Indiana Jones flies on the Clippers. Right, right. So you see that in the films. So it's so iconic. There's Mm -hmm. so much. Yeah history about it and there's so much technology that was pioneered for this and they depict it so well how they advance technology so quickly to to accomplish really what seemed impossible i mean you went from a short period of time where you've got Lindbergh who can barely limp one man a one-man plane across the ocean Mm -hmm. to now you've got an entire industry of air travel flying around the world It's, it's really it's it's a very interesting uh, show to watch. Um, it's only three episodes. It's available on Amazon Prime, and that's across the Pacific. We'll be right back. So we did have some afterthoughts. Sure. We got a lot of them, so we got to get through them real quick, right? Sure. So first coming up, uh, July 17th and 18th at one of our favorite locations is... Zolocon. <laughs> I love uh, saying that. I know you do. Uh, this one is in Warminster, Pennsylvania. Um, Zolocon.com is their website for ticket information and, and whatnot. Uh, then we have Monster Mania, which will have three different events. Uh, this Monster Mania. There we go. So uh, August 13th through 15th will be in Cherry Hill. September 24th through the 26th will be Hunt Valley, Maryland. And October 23rd and 20 th- 22nd to the 24th will be in Oaks, Pennsylvania. Then coming in September will be r- RetroCon. <laughs> that is also going to be in Oaks, Pennsylvania. And the dates for that one, um, we actually had them wrong last week. It's actually the 25th and the 26th 
of September. So close, yet so far. Eh, it was just a day off. Then in November is... Wizard World. Uh, Pennsylvania, which this is the first year in I don't know how long that it will not be at the Pennsylvania Convention Center, but the greater Pennsylvania, greater Philadelphia Convention Center, which is... So it's is, an even greater it's convention. <laughs> In Oaks, Pennsylvania. So set that in your GPS and just don't delete it because you're going to be going there a whole lot if you're from the area, obviously. Uh, and then our final convention of the year, as of right now, will be in December and is Ocean City Comic Con. <laughs> and that's going to be December 11th um, in the uh, Roland E. Powell Convention Center in Ocean City, Maryland. That's it, right? Because I think my voice is going to Yeah, I think point. that's it. I don't, I don't think I can do it anymore. Yeah, I don't think you can either. So, yeah, it's, it's nice to see that the conventions are starting back up again, that they're kind of spaced out. You know, normally convention season is... Usually just brief, the very summer. Brief. Usually, well, ZoloCon was usually always in February. Yeah, because there was usually There's snow always on the ground. snow on the ground whenever we would go, and then you kind of have a dry spell of a couple of months, and then you know, uh, Wizards used to be in June. June right. um, you know, and then you had a couple, and then it would kind of die off. So it's kind of nice that it's. Kind of spread out a little bit, gives you something to look yeah, forward to. Yeah, I like this because we always had like convention season. Mm -hmm. And like after convention season, there was nothing. Right, right. Which it's good and it's bad because it's good because the summer was very expensive. Right. And now I can spread that cost out over the course of, you know, 10 months. Right. Exactly. Which makes it more for I can finance convention season <laughs> I can now. Finance convention season. That that works out well. Yeah. So we'll you know, obviously we'll we'll keep an eye out for some of the other ones uh to see, you know, because some of the dates Where for Where was the other one you're talking about? What other one? The toy show. You just you Oh, the uh show. that one's the July what twenty fifth? Fifth, I believe, and that was Tom's River. Okay, so we have time um, to get that in the after right. So we'll next be week. able to get that one because that one one was one that popped up because originally the location was someplace further north in Jersey. Right uh, now, it's not as far north, so we might hit that one. And so. a programming note: we will be taking a week off. Uh, when are we taking off? Not next week. The so week the after. Week of the fourteenth, fifteenth. I believe so. So 14th, 15th, we won't be doing a podcast that week. We're slowing down that week and taking some time to ourselves and mm -hmm. relaxing a bit. Right. So that's our summer summer break there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, hopefully I'll, I'll get to redo some of the things in the uh, studio. But okay. I got I to gotta retile and rewire and rework my that. desk. And Charles. So your confidence in me is remarkable. I really appreciate it. <laughs> anyway, 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 before we go, I do want to bug you. I mean, uh, <laughs> ask you once again to uh, subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of the podcast listed as insights into entertainment. Video versions of all the, sh the network's podcasts can be found listed as insights into things on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, blah, 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 blah. You can also uh, reach out to us and give us your feedback. Tell us what we're doing right. Tell us what we're doing wrong. Point a finger at us and make fun of us for all the times I screw up. Uh, you can email us. No, you don't screw up unless it's a name. You don't oh, do right. names. No, I don't. Although I had Ludacris today, so I, I didn't do so well today <laughs> on names. Uh, you can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things. You can get audio versions of this podcast on the web at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. Com. You can find the video versions of all of our podcasts at youtube.com backslash insights into things. We do stream five days a week, both on Twitch and YouTube. Uh, 
you can get us on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. If you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you do get a Twitch Prime monthly subscription. I'm supposed to beg you to throw that our way. I have not begged you. Thank you very much. And finally, if you forget all those other links that we just said, and you just want to go to our main website, which has our beautiful photos and uh, bios about us, you can go to our main website, which is insightsintothings.com. Our bios are a fine example of my creative writing skills. Absolutely. We've never sounded better. I write fiction as good as Dr. <laughs> Seuss on those. Uh, and that's it for this week. Another uh -huh. one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.